whether you have known this place since its inception in 1972, or today is your first visit. A lot going on on this campus. A lot of it is around our environment and sustainability, and I think that all ties back really well to natural history. I want to begin by thanking a number of people and organizations that are making today possible, and that includes, in addition to this campus, Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, MCLA, our wonderful partner, and Noth Adams, Green Berkshires Incorporated, Orion Magazine, celebrating their 35th anniversary this year, the Hoffman Bird Club, Berkshire Sanctuaries, Williams College Center for Environmental Studies, also a wonderful partner to us, Hoosick River Watershed Association, Berkshire Environmental Action Team, BEAT, as well as Yard True Nature. And today, during the course of the day, we have some people out in the lobby area doing things to both help educate you and some opportunities to, to leave some of your largest here with the vendors. So please do what you can to support them. They're supporting this to make it possible. I want to thank our food service on the campus. We'll be taking care of you at breaks and at lunch today and at the rest of the little this afternoon, I think there'll be another break at 2 o'clock, and that'll be up in our brand new space. As I mentioned earlier, a lot has been going on at Berkshire Community College. We've been in the midst of a $30 million renovation, and I think you'll get to see some of that today, so we're excited to have you up on that space. This Boland Theater was just rededicated in honor of Bob Boland, our first faculty member. Berkshire Community College is the first community college of the 15 community colleges in Massachusetts. At, on this campus, and I'm sure on other campuses, they've chosen other like, ways to focus. We really focused on sustainability and the environment. You'll notice around all of our the rooftops on all, our, on all of our buildings, the only time we've ever appreciated flat roofs has been with a solar array. And we generate about 27% of our electricity for this campus, and we turn back in electricity during the summer. We're huge into composting and recycling, and we have actually won some awards around that. Recyclemania, a national contest. We were first in Massachusetts, and I think fourth in the nation. Is that right, Tom? Yes. And we, we value all of that. The other thing I was thinking about as I thought about how fortunate we are to be hosting this third conference, given the world we're living in today, is how much cataclysmic events seem to change natural history. If you think back, as we all studied uh, growing up and, and even today, a lot of times what happened there was a moment in history that changed everything, and it brought back the powers of observation to see how did that change what we're, how we look at the world, how we function in the world, what happens in the world. Right now, in just the last six months, we've had three major hurricanes, we've had earthquakes in Mexico and in, in both South and Central America as well as in Japan. We have wildfires spreading across California that are changing the landscape, changing people's worlds, changing the fauna, the birds, the mammals, everything that has been in, in those environments. And today there'll probably be opportunities to get you to think about the environments, the worlds, the natural history, uh, and how it changes and affects the way you look at situations you face each and every day. If we do more than, than we can do, just enough to make you curious and intrigued and inspired to go do something. If we create advocates out of this day, and advocacy can be anything from chatting with someone else about something you learned today, to uh, writing letters, to be out um, formally showing your feelings on certain issues. So thank you for coming today and deciding to invest a Saturday in your life, learning more about natural history, learning more about the powers of observation, learning more about um, how we impact this world and how the world is changing as we're living in it. 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, can you imagine the history that will be written about this very moment in time that we're living through? And it's our role and our responsibility to do what we can to positively impact that. I did want to thank a few more people who have, I've noticed a lot of people from the college. I know Laura Salvarini has been instrumental in making today happen. Proud to have a number of our faculty presenting today. Proud to have a student presenting later today. Alex Ripitz will be on the agenda later in the day. But it is now my very good pleasure to introduce Tom Tining, a faculty member in our environmental science program. Tom has been with us for a long time, but he's better known in, all around the community as the person with the rattlesnakes. 
and we love having the media here, we love having you come see what happens. I've been fortunate to help him on occasion to, to move the rattlesnakes around. Tom has really been a person who's about community, building community, creating people, uh, helping to spur interest and curiosity in the world around you. So I am pleased that he is part of our Fersher Community College family, and I'm pleased that we get to share him with you today. Welcome to Tom Tiny. How many people have been to both of, the, both of the other two? Look at those hands, totally cool. Those who are here for the first time, you will not want to miss all the others as we continue along. So uh, I do want to thank again all the speakers especially who have volunteered to come today. You're going to hear some really wonderful stories and, uh, and their personal stories. So after the breaks, uh, we'll have one uh, after Julie's talk, which is right after mine. And uh, one of the things we have, are doing this for, uh, and the reason this whole thing came about, is in this beautiful brochure that our PR uh, team has brought. This is where all your information is uh, in your folders. And uh, this, of course, happened about uh, five or six years ago, when, four or five years ago, when several of us, uh, many people, went to a memorial service that uh, Dave St. James mom and wife put on, and uh, they did it at Pleasant Valley's historic barn. And the hundred or so people who were there said, you know, gee, it'd be great if we could get together on an annual basis, uh, not only to uh, remember Day St. James, but all the historic naturalists from uh, the Berkshires and the immediate area around us. And so that's how this conference came to be. <clears throat> and I'd like to just point out to uh, Sophie St. James and Lucy, wave your hands, folks for uh, being here today and being here today. <laughs> Randy Wendell did the first history uh, uh, historic person at the uh, conference. Uh, Mr. El Eswaldo Bailey from the Cobble. Last year, Pam Weatherby talked about, the heck was his name? <laughs> oh yes, Eaton, this botanist. Uh, from jail to Yale, that's right, that's what we remember <laughs> most of <laughs> And today, what a surprise, uh, we're talking about Ralph Hoffman, the guy who, who, uh, whose name is on one of our buildings and who has done some interesting things. Uh, the information about Ralph is not easy to come by, especially local uh, information, although we are still working on this. And Matt Kelly really is the person who's been digging up a lot of this good information. But much of the stuff you're going to hear today has come from these two sources. So who was Ralph? You know, you say, uh, guess who Ralph was, and this is what you end up getting. Uh, some of the important Ralphs of the world. Uh, and these are tough guys, and they're important people, but, you know, look at this guy. This could be on a, on a post office uh, somewhere. Uh, so Ralph Hoffman is this quiet guy who was born in the Berkshires in 1870. Uh, in Stockbridge. His dad uh, was a surgeon in Napoleon's army, uh, came to America, and married uh, the second wife, um, a little woman named Catherine Bullard, as in Bullard's Woods, uh, down there in Stockbridge. Uh, she was listed in a uh, 1938 program of the Boston Symphony as a friend of the symphony. In other words, he married well. Uh, Ralph's dad did. He, uh, he was born in 1870 and at 20 years old graduated from this other little college in town called Harvard. Uh, the next year he began teaching at, uh, uh, at the Buckingham Brown and Nichols School. And then in 1894, uh, a family had moved from Germany uh, and he married their uh, young actress uh, daughter, uh, Gertrude. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, they ended up with uh, three children, all of whom have died in uh, a recent decade or so. But uh, that was uh, Ralph's early life. He was already a really good birder. In fact, uh, he was so good that he started uh, uh, at 24 publishing one of his first books uh, and second uh, publications for Massachusetts Audubon Society, uh, his uh, Bird World Book for Children. And then he wrote the text for 26 common birds from, uh, uh, for the Audubon bird charts. If you have one of those, it's probably worth a good six or eight bucks by now. Uh, but it's really spectacular. He didn't stop there. In 1901, he published bird portraits. Ernest Thompson Seaton, this is a guy who 
really revolutionized environmental education and environmental observation. Not so much birds, uh, Seton would, would uh, literally sit for hours to watch a single flicker, as in his paintings here, or other birds. And in fact, the modern environmental education movement in the 60s, 70s, and certainly in the 80s developed a, uh, an activity called Seton watching, where you go out and sit still for an hour or two, which uh, most of the students I know couldn't possibly imagine doing. Uh, but when you do that, uh, you will be shocked at what you see and find. He didn't stop there, and this was his big to-do. In 1904, he published The Birds of New England in Eastern New York. We have a couple of copies here on campus uh, at the Dunbar, one of our great naturalists who died a few years ago at 101 or so. Uh, she uh, donated her copy of her book to us uh, as well. This is considered to be the first real field guide ever done, and it was uh, illustrated by this little young kid named Fuertes, who if you haven't been to Cornell lately, uh, you should take a little field trip out there to see the Fuertes room and some of the most magnificent paintings ever made. In fact, his frontispiece for the birds of the Kinetic Valley of a peregrine falcon at Mount Tom is considered to be the most perfect bird portrait ever made in the history of the planet. And that uh, picture is stunning. Uh, and he illustrated uh, Hoffman's uh, Birds of New England. He dedicated it to his mom. And the big deal about this book was that it was about real field marks. Nothing had been published before uh, on being able to identify birds without the use of a shotgun. Uh, in fact, it was common even up to the 1930s that if you were a real ornithologist, you had to be a good shot. And Hoffman was the first one to say, listen to the bird look at its habitat and watch what it does. And those three things combined, in most cases, will identify the bird that, uh, that you're looking at. And of course, every field guide since, starting with the great Roger Torrey Peterson, has followed this system. He moved out of the Berkshires, uh, out of Cambridge uh, then, and uh, became the first headmaster of a little country day school, and doubled and eventually tripled the, uh, uh, the attendance at that school. He also published the, uh, the writing for the Common Birds series from Massachusetts Audubon in 1916. Uh, he then moved to California where he became a natural history teacher at the uh, Kate School, another private school. And that uh, interesting character on the bottom looks like he's about to murder that plant uh, is a uh, spectacular uh, uh, botanist and researcher, Ledyard Stebbins who uh, was really one of the great evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. He was under the spell of Hoffman and got his entire excitement uh, and love for science and nature, and especially plants, by, uh, by Ralph Hoffman. Uh, and so, what a surprise, Ralph wasn't just a birder, he was also a, a, a botanist, and in 1922, his flora of Berkshire County came out. It was almost 100 years after uh, this uh, smiley little Chester Dewey put out, uh, why are botanists like this? <laughs> I don't understand why you have to be, anyway. Chester Dewey had a great botany of the Berkshires, uh, but uh, when we learn from Pam Weatherby that uh, when she did her floor of Berkshire County, the same title as Ralph Hoffman on purpose, uh, in 1996, almost another 100 years. This was a really update, and uh, if you can see, uh, well, it's, too, it's not sharp enough, but uh, I've circled names of people that uh, Pam uh, thanked for being part of her publication, and four or five of them are sitting in this room right now. This is a great room of great people. She called uh, Hoffman uh, um, one of the excellent and complete lists of the flora of Berkshire County. Uh, she had, uh, of course, noted a lot of changes uh, in uh, the time she wrote hers and was very extremely uh, praising of Ralph Hoffman's work. Uh, Ralph, among other things, did describe the white form of the fringed orchid that uh, still in most in many uh, botanies uh, has his name. 
After he was the teacher at the uh, school, he became and was invited to be the director at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. He became their second director. The first director uh, uh, began uh, by a guy named Dawson in 1916 as a museum of oology, the study of bird eggs. And back then, collecting birds and their eggs especially was as passionate as for some people's collecting stamps. Uh, most of that, uh, most of us today would think this is a bad thing to do, but you should remember this is also the reason that uh, a, another New England naturalist, a little lady named Rachel Parson, was able to collect data on pre and post eggshell thickness for a pre and post DDT era and was able to combine her vast uh, knowledge of chemistry and physiology with evidence that showed that DDT had, among other effects, a lessening of, of um, a female bird's ability to produce calcium and shell thickness shrunk dramatically after the uh, DDT era to such a point that some people at Massachusetts Audubon uh, uh, found, uh, working down in Rhode Island, found an osprey nest, a female sitting on eggs, and when she lifted off, in fact, there was no eggshells at all. It was just a thin membrane uh, carrying the dead embryos in there. This was one of the most important um, sort of pastimes that really helped a lot. But while he was there, he worked hard and diligently for a number of years to publish the birds of the Pacific States. This is a really uh, improved version of what he did for the birds of New York and New England, and is considered to be um, sort of the first jumpstart into modern birding. Illustrated by Alan Brooks and uh, dedicated to his uh, brother and wife, who were big supporters of the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Uh, while Ralph was there, he got a chance to meet, uh, or uh, other people got a chance to meet famous Ralph Hoffman, the weird guy in the middle with the funny hair, uh, had just uh, a few years earlier got his uh, theory of relativity relatively um, confirmed, and uh, so he wanted to meet all the important people in the world, so he came, of course, to Santa Barbara to meet Ralph uh, Hoffman. Uh, it's there that they have a lot of papers about Ralph uh, Hoffman, but a fire destroyed many of them, but Matt Kelly just tells me the other day that they were very excited to have him. In the 1930s, he was uh, invited to get out to the Channel Islands to search for pygmy mammoth fossils. Uh, this guy just did a lot of stuff, and he was one of the great naturalists of all time. Pygmy mammoths found here on the islands uh, pre-Pleistocene time were, of course, typical of an understanding of, of um, small, big mammals being small on islands throughout the world. And he was excited to go out there. In addition, he was studying the grasses and sedges of the Channel Islands, so he was excited to go out there. And, uh, in 1932, went to San Miguel Island, the sort of northwest most of the Channel Islands. Uh, he headed off on his own to look for grasses and sedges, and they found him eight hours later dead at the bottom of a cliff. He, uh, his trowel that he was using to collect plants apparently broke, and uh, he dropped his death, and that point is now called Hoffman Point. I'm not sure that's a great thing, but it is. And so here is a copy of his uh, picture. So this uh, death of his, now remember, he still had Gertrude. <laughs> she started an acting career in Hollywood at age 60. And look at the movie she was in. Alfred Hitchcock, foreign correspondent, nominated for an Academy Award. The War of the Worlds, perhaps the greatest, weirdest movie ever made on the planet. She was in that. And then most men have known at least one Thelma Jordan. <laughs> she wasn't Thelma, nor was she even indicated in the playlist of these movies, but she was part of this stuff and went on to her, to her career there and died uh, just a few years ago. But today, of course, we have a couple of local institutions still remembering Ralph Hoffman when this campus was built and moved from 2nd Street in Pittsfield to out here at the Poor Farm, where most of us working for this Poor Farm still understand what that means. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it's fun, really. <laughs> At any rate, this, uh, uh, we have the uh, Kuzibitsky Center, we have Hawthorne and Hoffman, and, uh, and uh, who's the other building? Belleville, yeah, the whale guy. Came as far as he could from an ocean to write a book about whales. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> 
we needed an environmental science building with a with a with an environmentalist locally who wrote, and nobody could have been better than having Ralph Hoffman be that person. Now the book that we got of the Birds of New England States was given to us by Edna, and it was inscribed by Dana and guy named uh, Harold Davis, and the first volunteer naturalist at Audubon that I met when I moved here about 150 years ago was John Davis. And I said, is this guy related? So I called Nora Purdy, who knows everything about all of you and your ancestry. And she spent two days searching this guy's name and found that Harold Davis was probably an uncle of John Davis. But Harold Davis's father was a minister at the Congregational Church in Richmond and died also like Ralph, falling off a cliff, Bashfish Falls. Don't read these books. That's all I can say. So Ralph Hoffman really was the beginning of a major change in how we look at natural history. It was about standing and watching, listening, and writing down notes. And as we did this last year, let me take this moment before I forget to do it later. Um, how many of you here are members of the Hoffman Bird Club? Look at that. <laughs> My God. The rest of you should be. <laughs> and what a surprise they're selling those things here. In addition, uh, selling memberships, in addition, if you get a membership this year, you will also get a chance to buy the updated, spectacular book that um, we have on the Birds of Berkshire County by Dave St. James, and that is an incredibly detailed description of all the species here. So we've come sort of full circle in this little um, introduction to Ralph Hoffman. I hope you spend some time learning more about it. Come up to our building today if you have time, which you won't, uh, but certainly try another time to come up here. And our um, uh, Dean of uh, Sciences and uh, Math, uh, called up this morning and couldn't be here, which uh, we thank Laura for taking in. So I've decided that I will just stay up here all day and tell you more stories, but more importantly, introduce you to all of our other speakers. So uh, thank you all for listening to this, and I appreciate it.